Hi, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Um, I am Gerard Aching, Director of Africana. And it's a pleasure to welcome New York State Assemblyman Michael Blake, Assemblyman from the District, from district 79. Um, and it's not frequent that we get to listen to uh, the insights of somebody who's actually in government right now. So we are very keen to get his insights, um, and especially, as I mentioned to him, the title of that talk has, the talk has been intrigued. You know. But uh, let me tell you a little bit first. Um, Assemblyman Michael Blake is from the Bronx and works for the Bronx. Um, I put it that way because there are, you know, circumstances in which at times people who want to work for their communities are sometimes told they are not from their communities. So I just wanted to mention that at the beginning. He's an active pastor and mentor at churches, schools, and non-profit organizations in the Bronx. Moving more towards comments as far as, as President Obama is concerned, I'll begin just mentioning that he has been a supporter in 2008. Assemblyman Blake served as President Obama's first black staffer in Iowa and the 2012 National Deputy of the President's Operation Vote. In the White House, he was the Director of Outreach to Minority Businesses, African Americans, and State and County elected officials. He believes in fomenting an inclusive green economy capable of lifting people out of poverty and in providing youth with financial literacy empowerment. He knows his accounting. Assemblyman Blake finished out the campaign that brought him to his seat with, I understand, $3,446 still in the account. We know people who go into debt, right? substantial debt. He is passionate about political and economic empowerment for communities of color, paying particular attention to education, I had a chance to hear him, uh, to look at him and listen to him speak uh, about the Eagle Academy for Young Men in, in New York City, which is, uh, well, it's part of the Department of Education as a public school in the Bronx. He knows a great many details about the education system and focuses on that because I believe for him um, the schools are at the center of everything. You know, so this is very important for him. Without further ado, let me tell you, the title of this talk today, as some of you already know, I listened to President Obama and dreamed big dreams. So please uh, join me in welcoming New York State Assemblyman Michael Blake to Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we, there we go. Now, now, now we're back. It, it is a, a joy and a blessing to, to be here. I, I mentioned uh, to a few that this is my second time at Cornell. Uh, the first time I was here was nine years ago uh, because uh, I'm a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and I'm a life member and I was on the national board at the time and we all came up here for the pilgrimage. Uh, and it was much, much, much colder <laughs> when we came. Uh, when you come for a December 4th event uh, to Ithaca, uh, you, you are reminded you really have to love something uh, to do it. Uh, but it was good to be, it, good to be back uh, for this opportunity uh, itself. And uh, I don't take it for granted. I, I treat this as uh, an opportunity to share not just what our, our vision is, but uh, more importantly, hopefully, to, to let you know why you should go after your dreams uh, and a lot of reasons why we're told often um, why not uh, to go after them uh, itself. So we'll dive right in, uh, if that's all right. Uh, and I'm a very active uh, person. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, if I see you dozing a little bit, I'll, I'll call you out. No, I'm just playing, just playing. No, no, we'll just call it that. So my name is Michael Alexander Blake. I'm born and raised in the Bronx, New York, uh, the Bronx. Uh, is home for me. My family is from Jamaica. Uh, now, we have some TNT folk in the room. You know, invite me to Carnival. I, I, I'll be ready. I'll be ready for that as well. Uh, I was born with a heart murmur on Christmas Day. I was actually named after Jamaican politicians, so in so many different ways. 
Um, uh, it's indicative of what my history is supposed to be. My, my family told me often that I, I had three options, uh, of either being a politician, being in journalism, or being a preacher. Uh, so uh, at, at age 13, I became a lay minister. Um, actually, I minister in two denominations, United Methodist and AME. Uh, and my degree is in broadcast journalism from Northwest University it, itself. Uh, but politics has always been my passion. I, I truly believe there's no more comprehensive way you can help someone than through public service. And the way I always put that out there to the people, because you had to fight that in the past while I was about to come out right here. The way you have to fight that with people is to communicate that there is nothing you can think of that's not impacted by some form of policy in your life. I, I, I would encourage you to really ask yourself to think about that. From the moment you're born, throughout your entire life, from the moment you get cold off home, there's nothing that's not impacted by some form of public policy, federal, local, uh, city, etc. The Bronx is home. I mentioned this uh, in, the, in the lecture earlier. A lot of people may not realize the Bronx is home. The hip hop, doo wop, and salsa all three started in the Bronx. It was created as an effort to try to reduce the gang violence that is particularly there. Uh, obviously, we're also home to the 27 time world champion New York Yankees. I really hope that there are some Yankee fans here. If you're not a Yankee fan, then that's your loss. It's okay. Now, nonetheless, uh, I went to PS 79 for my elementary school. For anyone who's an educator in the room, you know that there's a book that Jonathan Colzer wrote about called Savage and Equality of Children in American Schools. That was my elementary school. I was there at the time. James Carter was my principal. That is real. Uh, it was very real. It was very present when, when Principal Carter spoke up that we were hoping to get the 10th best teacher. That was not a theoretical exercise. That was very true at the time. 118 D.O.A. Clinton and then Northwestern University, which I am in a fabulous mood because Northwestern beat Stanford this past Saturday, 16-6. So uh, it, things are always going to be better for me. I had a chance to really think through the journey. And, and when I process what the collective journey opportunity is, you have to put this in perspective for me. I'm a kid that my, my mom was uh, growing up in Alexandria, Jamaica. My, my great grandmother on the maternal side and others are from Brownstown uh, itself. Uh, and my, my family name on both sides, Blake is my fraternal name uh, on my daddy's side, my mother's side, it's Henry. Uh, and she married and announced last name Lawrence. Uh, itself. My, my mom slept on church pews at Evans and I met to this church. Uh, three different times we almost lost our house in the Bronx. We sold, uh, sold uh, you know, food on Saturday afternoons, uh, not just because she's an amazing cook, but also because we were having money to get money for rent uh, to try to make sure we had that money in that manner. And what happened along the way, I decided I wanted to find a way to give back uh, and to really try to transform some things in this particular manner. service doesn't stop. <laughs> you know, we, uh, I, I reflected on how we could give back and I thought about the ways that I had seen over the years how people weren't being helped in my, my hometown. I thought about the time when I was in high school when a cop who was about 100, uh, about 100 yards away turned around his car and said that he heard me yelling at him even though his windows were rolled up. I was still trying to process how that could be possible. I, I thought about the times um, regularly, um, where I had relatives that were locked up for crimes that they didn't commit. I thought about times regularly where people saw that just because I was from the Bronx, they presumed that we weren't smart enough, we weren't capable, we couldn't do incredible things. So we wanted to transform that. And so I went to school, studied journalism, because I, I thought and still do that communication is so important in terms of the, the mechanism as it relates to public service and politics. You think about what's going on right now for the 2016 election, we can obviously talk through that through. That message is so critically important in everything that's happening. If you can't articulate a message, you can't articulate a vision. If you can't demonstrate your dreams, no one can dream those dreams. Uh, and there are a lot of people who they can't articulate their policies, they can't really get through what's going on and it's creating opportunities, you know, on, on both sides. You know, regardless of your political affiliation, you think of on one side the Democratic side, you, you have the, the rise of Bernie Sanders because he is tapping into something that is out there. At the same time, you have Secretary Clinton who's able to talk about the historical nature that can happen. On the other side, when you think about Donald Trump, it doesn't matter if someone thinks you're, he's credible or not, there are people that believe in him because of a message. Uh, and so for me, communications was a way to demonstrate that as well, for me to be able to articulate a message there. So in 2005, a woman walked in, she said, if you don't have him, I'll lose my home. Uh, we had a week to help her keep her home. She kept her home, we were able to help her in that manner. I 
decided to apply for a lot of different jobs while I was doing that internship. And you have that kind of wake up moment when you realize that I'm not really fulfilled in the job that I have right now. And I was working in TV at the time, uh, and I had a very similar routine. You wrote highlights for a show, you wrote highlights for another show, you wrote highlights for another show, you would go home. Uh, and I just started to think, this is not what I'm here for. Uh, I didn't feel like I was living out my purpose. I didn't feel like I was actually doing something substantial and tangible in that way. And so I applied for a lot of jobs. And during the second interview of a job with Unite here, I was sitting there engaging and interacting with a few uh, folks uh, in the cafeteria. And you, when you interact with these hotel and restaurant employees who are just thinking to themselves, I'm just trying to figure out how to make ends meet, and at the same time, their job is to make sure someone else feels better, uh, it puts it in perspective uh, very quickly, the, the dichotomy that's happening in terms of what's happening in our respective lives. So I was offered an opportunity to work for Unite Here, but I turned it down because I couldn't afford it. Uh, I couldn't afford the salary they were going to offer me. And during that final interview, they told me, well, you know, my son is Deputy uh, Political Director for Senator Obama. His name is Nate Tamron. They're starting a program called Yes We Can. It's going to train people how to run campaigns. You should learn about it. You should understand this. We can build up in that way. Okay, wonderful, great. Uh, so then I was called back two days after I turned down the job. And they said you should really apply for this program. So the first time I made a phone call, I called Nate. All Nate knew was that I was the guy that turned down his father. So needless to say, he kind of kind of hazed me on the phone a little bit, right? Because uh, they didn't know anything else thereafter. But then, fortunately, in 2006, I was accepted into the program. Uh, Ten of us were trained on how to run campaigns by then Senator Obama. The first time I met Senator Obama was January 2006. We were at the Holiday Inn on the Hill. And there were a few moments that happened that I knew this person was a special person. First was all the hotel staff were coming out into the hallway, and they just wanted to see him which I was just trying to process that how he was a United States Senator at this time, this holiday in this hotel that's near the Capitol, and he's clearly in walking distance around here, and this, this, the staff was willing to risk their jobs just because they wanted to see him. And then I watched how he made it a point to stop and talk to them before he even came into the room. And when you see that someone can realize that it's not about me, it's about what these people believe because of me, then I was like, okay, there's something different about this person. He then came into the room, there were different round tables, and I was sitting at one of the round tables, and Nate, who's become a political mentor of mine, told him, he was like, well, you know, boss, you know, Blake, you know, Blake was on the Hines team. Now, you have to understand, in Illinois, what that meant was Dan Hines, who was one of the people that ran against uh, Senator Obama for United States Senator. So he was like, oh, so you weren't with me. I was like, hold on, man, don't hold on, don't go. let that go, let that go, you know, that, that was in the past, we're gonna move on from this right now, you know? Uh, and I turned to Nate, he's like, why do you wanna do that to me? This is the first time I've been meeting him right now. And he said, you know, what do you wanna do? And I was like, I wanna learn politics. I wanna, I wanna understand this, I, I just, I'm just excited about this. He came back the next day, and he started talking about his vision and his dreams and pursue that. At the end of the week, they asked me, what do you wanna do? I said, I wanna run campaigns. He said, okay, all right, good. We were thinking the same thing. So they sent me to Michigan to go run three state house races. 2006, Michigan, on a national scale, you may remember, this is when, in 2006, Democrats took back the majority of the United States Senate. There was a huge turnover that happened collectively. A lot of that was happening in the states. So I was given three races. One was for a woman named Barb Byron, whose uh, mother was the retiring Democratic leader. We felt good about her race, and we felt like we could make this one happen. Second race was for a gentleman named Reverend Robert Dean, who was the president of the city council of Grand Rapids, Michigan, running in an open seat, but it was going to be a battle. Third was of a woman named Mary Valentine, who had never run for office before. She was a speech pathologist. She was a Democrat who was running against a two-term incumbent named David Farhat, whose sister was the Republican incumbent before him, uh, and whose father was the high school legendary football coach. So no pressure, right? We were down four seats in Michigan, and. I was told we weren't gonna, we could only win one of my races. End of election night, we won all three of our races. Uh, and then we flipped the house from four seats down in the minority to four seats uh, up in the majority. The gentleman who now thinking, he was thinking he's running for minority leader is now running to be speaker of the state of Michigan. So that kind of changes everything immediately. So the second time I meet him, his name is Amy Gillen. He says, you know what, Blake, I've been hearing a lot about you. I just want to learn a little bit more. Uh, and I want you to work in my cabinet. And I said, that's great, but I work on one, one condition. If Senator Obama runs for president, you'll let me leave. He said, done. Which I was surprised about. I realized, year plus later, 
that Andy Dillon, who was a speaker, didn't tell anybody, but he wanted President Obama to run for president. Uh, and he actually was the first statewide leader in Michigan to endorse us in the campaign. So two months later, speech in Springfield happens. Everyone's excited. You're, you're moved. This is amazing. It's incredible. Fantastic. I get a phone call from Tori Scarborough, who accepted me to the training program. She says, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. I'm doing well. I'm excited. If I can help out in any way, let me know. She said, oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, I'll be in touch. A week later, she calls me back. She says, send me your resume. I was like, hey, I'm at the Capitol right now. I don't know if I can send me your resume. She said, maybe you didn't hear me the first time. She sent me your resume. Now, I'm going to tell this to all the brothers in the room. When a sister says, do something the first time, just do it the first time. It's going to make it like much easier. <laughs> Things will be much smoother if you just do that. You're going to avoid a lot of conflict right there. So, I sent my resume the second time. I get a phone call an hour later from Emily Parcell, who's the political director in Iowa. She said, I've been hearing a lot about you. I want to talk to you. A week later, I had a 45 minute phone interview with Emily Parcell. Three days later, I flew to Iowa for an in person interview with Paul, who's the safety director. Eight days later, on March 3rd, 2007, I went to Iowa to move there. March 4th, 2007 was my first day. March 7th, 2007, I was organizing a Southeast Iowa trip for then Senator Obama. I worked for him for 20 months, from March 4th, 2007 to November 4th, 2008, uh, throughout the campaign. Eight states, 20 months, and, and we won. You know, and my job in Iowa was to organize the Iowa caucus, the constituency outreach component of the Iowa caucus. So just so you are aware, because most people have no understanding what a caucus even means um, whatsoever, you're going to hear about this a lot leading up to 2016, this is the best way to think about a caucus. If you're 18 years old the day that the caucus happens, you can caucus. That's the first thing. Second thing, you walk into a room, 6.30 p.m., if you decide I want to be a part of this process, okay, great, wonderful, each campaign will give a particular speech. 7 o'clock, folks will start dividing up into their particular corners. And it's a public process. It's not like a primary and other votes where you actually go into a ballot box. A caucus is a public process. Everyone in that room will see what you are doing. 7.30, stops. If you have 15% in the room, you get delegates and you're viable. If you don't have 15%, then two things happen. You either have to move to another candidate, you move to undecided. And then you have 30 more minutes to try to get someone to come to your side. They go to undecided, or they're done. At 8 o'clock, everything's done. That's it. So you're pretty much spending 10 months to prepare for 90 minutes. And our job was to get young people, communities of color, women, LGBT, and veterans, and Native American, whoever it may be, to believe in this vision of what he talked about. This is a dream, you know, and a lot of things that he discussed. You know, we, we will always kind of talk through how do you make this happen and how do you visualize this? Well, people believe that he could do something aspirational, and we, we wanted to change, chase that and make that happen. So, campaign ends. They asked me, okay, come to D.C. I did the inauguration in D.C. Uh, the greatest honor I had with doing the, had the inauguration is I was on the bus with the King family taking them to the Capitol on, on inauguration day, which, you know, they crying, I'm crying, everybody's crying, it's all emotional, you know, it's all right, grown men can cry, it's a good thing, you know, it makes you feel good, you're vulnerable, right? You know, you know and, and you're in that moment, I like that you got a good little energy for you, you know, you're in that zone and you're starting to think, what could be going through their mind right now that they're the King family and they're about to see an African American become president? And that thought of dream resonated again. So then I was asked to go, you know, finish the inauguration, and then the inauguration ended, and then a phone, you know, phone starts ringing, and it said 202. There were no other numbers there. Now, because I thought it was a bill collector, I didn't pick up the phone. But what I realized after the fact when I checked the voicemail is that it was a voicemail from the White House uh, from Valerie Jarrett, uh, who has become like the second mom to me. And Valerie said, Welcome to the White House. And so in February 2009, I joined the White House. I was the director of African American Outreach. Director of Minority Business Outreach, Director of State and Local Outreach to, to county officials and attorneys general, et cetera. And I reflected back on what the president first told me when, he, when I first saw him. And it said, Michael, dream big dreams. Uh, and that's when I took a picture with him uh, and Ellen Malcolm, who was running Ellen's list at the time. 2011 happens. It's time. Things are getting intense. Uh, we see that there's going to be a battle on the other side as it relates to the election. And I go to David Pluff, and I said, Pluff, you know, I just, I need your advice. What do we do from here? Where do we go? What are we supposed to do? And he said, Blake, you will never forgive yourself if you're sitting here and we lose. And so I left the White House, and I went to the re-election uh, to be the National Deputy for Constituency Organizing. And it was an, an indescribable experience. Now, a lot of people may not realize this. We felt confident the entire time there was, we weren't going to lose either election, because numbers are numbers. The campaign is just about numbers at the end of the day. It's about who has the biggest list. And we had really 
ran through the particular numbers itself. Uh, something, you know, here's a perfect example. I'll give it to the example. Uh, and when it was Bush versus Gore, what state was everyone talking about? Florida. Florida. Uh, did you know that Gore didn't win his home state? And also did not win the state of New Hampshire? If Gore wins the state of New Hampshire, four electoral votes there, Gore would have been president. We're not even talking about Florida. When it's Bush versus Kerry, what state are we talking about? Ohio. Everything came down to just one state. We made a decision, we're not going to do that. We're going to have multiple paths to victory. So for the first election, we knew there were at least five different paths to victory. Here's different things, different scenarios, worst case scenarios, but we will prepare no matter what or how to get there. In 2008, there were 10 electoral states that were considered swing states. We won all 10. 2012, we had 42 paths to victory. We had paths that even if we lost Florida and Ohio, we knew we could still find a way to win. We won nine of the 10 battleground states. The only state we didn't win was North Carolina, and that's because of Superstorm Sandy. And we were ahead in the early vote. And when people talk about the impact of voting, especially when we talk to the college students, North Carolina, we demonstrated that. We, we were able to get early votes to come on in in North Carolina, and that got people part of the process who otherwise were not part of the process. So I then decided, after all that was done, it was time to go home. My dad was getting ill. Uh, I wanted to help take care of him. I helped one of my friends run for office. And then this amazing thing started to happen. And there's an assembly district that I represent where a elected official was arrested uh, and was going to go to jail for corruption. Uh, and I then uh, got a phone call and a conversation of, hey, have you thought about running? I said, well, I always wanted to run. The question was just when. And I said, well, what do you should think about running now? So I decided to run. And one thing that then happened was I told them about something that happens of New York State residency, where you have to hit two thresholds. Five year resident of the state, one year of the district, I'm at the date of the election. I communicated, I will meet both thresholds despite the fact that I voted in D.C. because in the New York State Constitution it says, do you have a residence? Does it say your only residence? Does it say you don't have residence anywhere else? It says, do you have a residence? Which I have through my mother's house because I never give that up. The same folks that had recruited me to run that suit me. Uh, and I had three lawsuits, uh, and we won all three. I had to go all the way to the Court of Appeals uh, for folks trying to get me off the ballot. But the amazing thing is, in the New York State Constitution, is a federal law that says if you serve the federal government, you never rescind your residence, which is what we indicated the entire time. I said, look, I was serving the country. And you know, fortunately, justice prevailed. And we were able to run. And we ran our race. And it was a six-way race. And it seemed like all odds were against us. And folks were wondering if we could make it. And in a six-way race, we won by 12 and a half points. Uh, and just to put that in context itself, uh, we, the, you know, Marsha Mike was in the, the second uh, candidate, she was the, the county candidate. Uh, this is a district that is 53% Latino. Uh, there were two Latinos in the race uh, itself. And a place where a uh, person that came in second um, resided in the, in the area of the district that had the largest voting block. Uh, and we still won by 12 and a half points uh, in the primary. And uh, we kept doing the work. And we won by 87 points in the general election. Uh, we, we like to win. win. Winning is good. I heard this one quote uh, at a uh, uh, University of Rochester a commencement speech uh, for the business school. And, and the gentleman gets up to the CEO and said, you know what? Winning is great. Losing sucks. Losing on a bad team, that double sucks. You don't want to double suck. So you know, I was like, OK, great. OK. <laughs> If that's a strategy, great, great strategy. <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever is going to work, you know, coach your team, right? Uh, so I represent the Bronx. Let me give you some context of the Bronx. The Bronx is the most diverse county in America. 89.3% likelihood the next person you interact with in the Bronx is a different ethnicity. Salsa, hip hop, doo wop, the Yankees, all these things that we talk through that are here. The largest West African community outside of West Africa represent is in the Bronx. Park Avenue, Webster, Washington, Claremont community. One college within the district, whatever college, and then surrounding it are other institutions, Hostess Community College, Lehman, et cetera, et cetera. You already talked to the demographics itself. 139,000 people, uh, the Latino number.
was 58%, 39% African American. The voting population is slightly different, but again, that just kind of gives you context of what is going on in our district, an incredibly diverse community. Um, and, and we're building and we're constantly building. And it's one where you always have to engage uh, and be prepared and be collaborative and make sure you're not, you're not doing this on your own. So when you go into some communities, you say, hi, my name is Michael Blake, I'm your assemblyman. In other communities, you say, hey, nobody's going to get a Blake assembly, he's about this, she's still sent up and women. And having to be ready and be engaged to collaborate in that particular manner. So where does that then lead you to? It leads you to a vision. And, and my dream is transforming the Bronx to the urban metropolis of the world. Heavy stairs right there. People are like, oh, okay, whoa, well, where are we going right now? Where are we going? You know, just big, big vision, big vision, big things, big things, right? Bronx Lebanon Health and Wellness Centers within my district, 972 bed and hospital uh, systems that are there. Golden Cross, second largest employer within our district. Southeast Bronx Neighborhood Centers doing incredible work throughout our district. I have 89 schools in my district in a 30 block radius. Just process that for a second. 89 schools in a 30 block radius. How on earth could that be? Because when Mayor Bloomberg took the approach of doing the larger campuses to smaller schools, that impacted us greatly. So the Jane Addams High School, multiple schools in there, Morris High School, multiple schools in the Conquest Village, et cetera. And we're constantly engaging in that manner. 178 schools of New York were listed on the struggling schools list throughout the state of New York. 10 of them were in my assembly district. Now, to put that into context, there are only 150 assembly districts in all of New York State total. 150 assembly members, 63 senators, 213 people represent 19.4 million people. So I have 10 of the 178 struggling schools in one district by itself. Six of which uh, were determined to be community schools and renewal schools and how we can help these schools turn themselves around. So we get asked, how do you do that? Well, we build out something with the community, so Mid Bronx Desperados, which is focused on affordable housing and making sure that it's truly affordable. Because a lot of times we throw around the word affordable, it's not really affordable. People can't afford what's going on there. No skidamos. How do we have uh, Melrose Commons projects and build out a community and think about the public health component that's happening with the community? Yes, you can build, but if you can't breathe, then what's the point? VIP community services. How do we help people that try to turn their lives around in a transformational way? The schools that we have here. You know, Verizon just recognized one of our elementary schools with a $20,000 grant because of the, the technology advancement that these young people are doing. SUNY and CUNY having free programs on, on technical pre preparation, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, though. 21% of my residents live in the projects. Public housing. Folks are going to say, well, man, how, how do you make that work? How, how do they advance themselves? How are we going to make sure we progress itself? 7% overall unemployment, additional 9.4 working part time. Poverty, poverty is real. 2013 survey estimates 56,496, roughly 40% of people that live in the 35 census tracts within my assembly district are below the poverty line. 39 percent on average, 25 and 8, uh, 25 and up, don't have a high school diploma. Median income through the district, $24,000. So I, I understand people are like, it's not possible. How do you make it? How do you make it happen? How do you make this happen? We make this happen from a vision. A vision we call 321. This is how I help people realize their dreams. Three stands for the three E's of economic development, education, and equality for all. Two are the two paths to get those three E's. How do I strengthen minority women-owned business enterprises and how do I create a career-oriented education? Why? Because I want for that young person to go from the cradle to the career. I don't want you to just go from the cradle and get a diploma and you can't get a job. How do I make sure you can transform your life thereafter? And what's the one? How do I transform the South Bronx to make the urban metropolis of the world? And in and, and order to do that, you have to show people that they can make that happen. How do you get them access to credit? How do you get them access to opportunities? How do you write legislation that's real? Because a lot of people don't believe that legislation matters. They don't think that what's going on with politicians matter, that it won't impact your life. So if you are a minority women owned business right now in New York State and you are doing work for the state, 30 days, that's the time to apply. Put in an invoice before I'm supposed to get my payments back. What happens if that payment's late? Then your, your payroll's delayed. 
There's someone that can't pay the bills. There's somebody that doesn't have money for their family. So we wrote legislation to condense that time to 15 days because I felt if I can get people paid faster, it gives them a better chance to be able to advance their dreams. How do we advance their dreams? We, we collaborate with MSNBC, who on this upcoming Thursday, the Bronx is going to be the third place in the country. We're going to come in as part of the Growing Hope campaign. They were in the Bay Area, then they went to Detroit, and they're coming in. We're going to showcase an event. We have a building. It's the historic county courthouse. Bronx became a county in 1914. It was the last county to become a county in New York State. 1977 is when the final services left in the courthouse. 1978, building became vacated. Nothing was in the building for 37 years until this year. We had an art exhibit that came into the building. Now what are we doing? We're working on having a universal hip hop museum within the building. We're working on having a food accelerator so that companies can advance their dreams and make sure that they're creating an economic opportunity, but might make sure people also eat healthy. We're doing all these things to transform what's going on in the Bronx so people can understand and see that. So if you have time, Tune in. Uh, you'll be able to see what we're doing live on Thursday. Remember, MSNBC will be broadcasting live uh, in collaboration with Yes We Code, uh, Ford Foundation, and others for something that we believe will be a very transformational event. If you were in the Bronx that day, you would also be able to enjoy the after party we're doing with DJ D Nice, but it's okay. You'll be up here, but you'll be doing it. It's all right. <laughs> education. How, how, how do I chase that dream? How do I realize that dream? Because I, I need to make sure that if you don't have a good education, you don't have a chance in the first place. Why is it relevant? Because did you understand and do you understand that third grade literacy rates are the barometers on how people decide to build prisons in this country? Y'all still with me right now? Third grade literacy rates is the barometer on how prisons are built. They're assessing from that early on what's the direction and trajectory in your community. So for me, I said, okay, how do I transform this? What do I need to do? Well, let's increase funding so pre-K can have a chance. How do we bring in an initiative called Workshop for Business Opportunities at Board April College so that 20 entrepreneurs can get trained for 16 weeks so they can advance their dreams and go help other young people realize their dreams? How do we collaborate with TechPen, a nonprofit that's doing amazing work? Where what they're gonna do, they're gonna provide 40 tablets for young people and 100 desktops for senior citizens. Because I want more people to understand that your dreams are possible, they can be connected, they can be realized. How do I ensure that your dream gets realized? Because then I can talk to you about young people who realize their dreams because they saw what we were able to do. Like a more white, a more lost his father in the ninth grade, got in trouble, didn't think things were possible. Now he's interning in our office, about to go off to school and be a 12th grade senior and say, you know what, I want to go do things with my life and transform it in a way. The lower the wall, those are young people in the products that came over to say thank you because we got them book bags and school supplies and they started to believe that, you know what, it's possible. And I can go up to them and say, I understand it's not, not going to be easy. I understand it's going to be a trajectory. I understand you have to put in the work. But I did the exact same thing like you did. I grew up like you did. I went the same trajectory like you did. I understand how to be hungry like you are. However, it's not an excuse to make it happen. I'll tell them something all the time. There's a rule that we live by called 5 P's, proper preparation prevents poor performance. And the young people are like, oh, okay, now, now I, I can see what can actually get there. I, I advance their dreams by elevating the Eagle Academy, and we put forth legislation so that the state can examine the great work of the Eagle Academy, which is helping black and Latino young men who otherwise didn't feel like they had a chance, didn't feel like they can grow up, didn't feel like they can excel, accelerate themselves. How do we take this and take it to scale so that more schools, more parents, more educators can learn about these opportunities for these young people? And Eagle Academy, just so you know, because of the great work that they're doing, has been celebrated on CBS News. If you go online, find CBS News, find Eagle Academy, you'll be able to see the things that are happening there. When we talk about how to push out the message, push out the word, push out the voice, I'm very active on social media, on, on Instagram, Mike Blake 1922 on Twitter, and on Mike Blake, we want to put that out there. Why? Why does it matter? Why does social media matter? Because in 2012, when we were done, the Facebook population, Barack Obama and his friends, his first ring of, first ring of friends, were connected to 95% of the U.S. Facebook population. What, do I then, what am I able to do then? I'm able to then push out information to individuals who may not be registered to vote, push out information to individuals who may not be thinking about that, and connect to your Facebook friends who are not registered, get them registered, and get them part of the process. This was a rally. We were talking about how to ensure that people can have affordable housing and give them a chance to realize that dream. Why do they not understand it's possible? Because they don't think anyone's speaking their voice. But when I tell them, I know what it's like to wonder. 
as my mom will always tell us about, you know, going from no house to the White House to the state's house. This is real. We partner with Urban Justice Center so that they can have a know your rights form so we can talk to the young people in the community and talk to senior citizens in the community about how to keep your home. We talked about how to collaborate with the mayor and others on affordable housing. And then you can't stop there if you want to realize some dreams. Criminal justice, you know the number one issue that is impacting communities of color right now? When you look at all the polls, it's not jobs, it's not education, not housing, it's race relations. It's criminal justice reform. What's going on right now? How do I feel when I'm interacting with an officer? So we put forth legislation, 7501, so that someone can have an opportunity to get medical authorization to understand if you have a relative that's incarcerated, you should be able to know about their health benefits, their health access, what's going on with their life, so that you can communicate that to them and vice versa. Equally, 7825, if someone happens to lose their life, unfortunately, you should be able to understand what's the reason why, while equally making sure we push for a raise the age. Why? Because Khalif Browder was my constituent. Khalif Browder, who died at 16, took his life, at 19, took his life, went in at 16, Rikers Island, two and a half years, he's there because of a book bag, a book bag that said he didn't steal. You know why? Because New York State is one of two states in, in America where 16 and 17 year olds are still tried in criminal court as adults. It doesn't make sense. Dreams being deferred because we're not putting in that work right now. How do we have better uniform police standards? How do we push forward for a special prosecutor? How do we march with the Justice League to say that we want to make sure we transform the game and tell people that I'm going to be your voice so that you can realize these particular dreams? And if they still don't believe, then tell them that you met someone who has been living out this dream because Barack Obama told me to dream big dreams. That quote was in the Bronx, New York. When we asked the president to come to the Bronx to launch My Brother's Keeper Alliance. Because I, I said, you know what, this, this is an opportunity for, for you to show all the people of this country what can happen here. People think about the Bronx, they think about the most negative things, they don't think about the aspirational things, the incredible things, and what can happen for those that come from here, that you can realize your dreams. That's what I'm trying to do, so help us do that. So, this was a photo here. You know, got to hang out with the big boss, have some fun with him. Now, sometimes he, he reminds me that he is the big boss, you know, like so when I first told him I was gonna run for office, he said, oh, what are you gonna run for? I said, I'm gonna run for state assemblies. And I'm very proud of you, but you know what, Michael? I ran for state senate, I mean, assembly's okay. It's like, wow, okay, way to crush my thoughts. That's, that's great, you know, way, way, way to be a good mentor right there, right? <laughs> then I saw him again at CBC, we had a conversation. He's like, I really hope that you get some money together because you're gonna be broke. Oh man, thanks. Thanks, boss. I really appreciate that. So then, I think third time is going to be a charm. It's going to be great. We've got a great conversation. I said, boss, look, I got stationery. I got stationery now. I have my name on it, have the logo on it. That's wonderful. He's like, oh, okay, really? So then he autographs it, really, Barack Obama. So, so when you can have a president who's cool enough to still give you a little bit of grief but still help you out at the same time, that's a pretty good mentor to have to make sure to change the way, change the game, and talk to people and just say, Michael, I'm proud of you. Michael, I believe in you. When you can engage with the governor of New York, who yesterday I was in, in Brooklyn at the West Indian Day Parade, marching with, with the governor. I gave him full warning. I was like, my family's from Jamaica, so when, when I hear jump or hear anything else, just be ready, just be ready. I, I can't control myself when that happens, so we we're, were all good. We all had a good time, you know? You know, I didn't get any acting sausage, but it was all right. Next time, next time, we'll go down there, right? So we have a governor who says, you know what? I, I believe in what you're talking about. You're trying to do some positive things. I support you. And I saw him yesterday, he's like, you know what, I, I really appreciate what you're trying to do right now. For, for me to be able to go back home, then I can go talk to the young people and say, look, I understand where you're coming from, but you can make this happen. You can make this happen. I know you can make this happen. And why am I so sure? Because of Jacob Philadelphia. When you get the chance to serve the administration, you get a chance to, to be around the president, and you, you get the opportunity for a departure photo, the gentleman off to the side is Carlton Philadelphia. Carlton was a national security staffer. He was leaving the administration. He had served under President Bush and President Obama. He was deciding that his time had come. When you get a chance, you get to bring your family in. He brought his wife, his two children in. They said, Mr. President, both of my children have a question, but we don't know what the question will be. Now, for any of you who are parents, you probably be terrified right now. Your, your child is going to ask the President of the United States a question. You have no idea what it's going to be. It can go off the rails real fast, real fast. Your business can be out there real quick. And you don't know what's going to happen right there. So you just got to be hopeful. So they said, just go ahead, go ahead. So his first child, Isaac, the older child, said, uh, Mr. President, why don't you eliminate the F-22 fighter jet program? He's like, well, what, 
because it costs too much, right? Probably surprised you that a kid's asking that kind of question. But the question that resonates, the question that reminds you that you can still realize dreams, the question why I listened to the president to go run for office, and the reason I thought to myself, I need to go make my dreams happen, I need to go pursue that, is because of what Jacob asked. Jacob said, Mr. President, I just got a new suit. And um, I just got a haircut. Okay, okay. But I was wondering if I could touch your hair to know who feels like mine. So initially he kind of paused for a second and then he said, touch it, dude, just touch it. And then, he touched it. Photos hang up at the White House about every seven to ten days. This photo is going to be there the entire time of his presidency because he said it will hang up that entire time. Why? Because Jacob processed in his mind at just five years old. You know what they tell me? I'm supposed to be only a ball player or a rapper. That's the only way I'm supposed to make it. I'm supposed to be on the corner. That's the only way I'm supposed to make it. But you look like me and you're the president, so I can make it. But the way he had to process that as he had to touch his hair. We didn't tell a lot of folks the story, now it's out there. You go type in Jacob Philadelphia New York Times, and you can find the story, you can find the you can find that information. It, it, it reminds you of what's possible when you decide to pursue your dreams. If someone like me who comes from the Bronx, a place that they try to act like the Bronx is still burning and things not happening, a place where Colin Powell and Sotomayor and all these incredible people have come from to transform the game, where Ralph Moore and County Cullen and James Baldwin all went to high school, a place where there's transformational things that are happening, this is how I help realize dreams. So my way to now do that is to make sure that I'm an elected official helps the people in my community. I want them to understand that my heritage is a heritage that starts from Jamaica and went to the Bronx. And every time they look at that, they can understand the full name of Michael Alexander Blake from the 79th District, one who's going to be serious about his work and one that's serious about helping the people. So if you want to be with me and be on this journey and go like we did from No House in Jamaica to the Black House in Northwestern to the White House in D.C. to the State House in Albany, that's what we do to realize their dreams. I realized my dream because I wanted to run for office. I realized my dream because I wanted to pursue office. I realized my dream because I just wanted to help somebody. And that's what we're doing right now. So if you want to join what we're doing right now, we left our information up on the screen. We want for you to build with us. No matter where you're at, we're, we're building something special right now. We want people to understand that this, this is going to be something transformation that's going to happen. That they're going to think about the Bronx and the legacy that we leave here and what can be possible. Close with this. There's, a, there's a, a man who was driving for a long time trying to figure out his way. Driving, 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 and all of a sudden he runs out of gas. Has to make a decision do I keep going? Go find a gas station, get gas, come on back, or do I stand here and just hitchhike for a ride? Now, if he just hitchhikes the ride, he's going to take care of himself. But if he goes to get a gas, he's a chance to maybe go help a few more people. So he makes a decision, I'm going to go to the gas station. Let me go, go to the gas station. He's at the gas station, thinking I'm just going to pick a few things, get back in the car. Because he was, he was feeling lost, feeling like his life was all over the place. Not anything going to be possible. But then a weird, surprising thing starts to happen. The flowers started to talk to him. Flowers making noise. Sir, sir, pick me, pick me, pick me for your journey. Let me be on your journey. Pick me, pick me. So then the Rose starts to get a little bit louder and says, pick me for the journey. And he said, you know, I, I can't take you, Rose, because there's a, there's a level of arrogance right here. It doesn't feel just right for what I need. He, he listens to a few more flowers and all of a sudden the lily starts to speak. The lily says, pick me, pick me. And he says, you know, for what I'm going through and what I want to achieve, I need something more confidence. And he kept listening, kept listening, but there was one part that didn't say anything and it was the carnation. The carnation wasn't saying words. So he said, Carnation, Carnation, tell me why should I pick you? Everybody else is telling me why. I didn't say a word. Carnation, again, why should it be you? Man, frustrated, about to walk away. He says, sir, I didn't have to say anything. Because I am what I am. I am what God created me to be, and I'm here to help anyone along their journey if you want that for me to be you. 
once you realize that you are the carnation that can dictate your own journey and that people can help you supply the resources around you, you can realize any dream you want to realize. So what's my dream? My dream was run for office. My dream was hopefully one day be president. No matter what happens along the way, at least I achieved the first dream. Kind of listen to the president dream the big dreams in that anyway. Thank you, everybody. Bloomberg was mayor. Right. Bloomberg. 
Bloomberg didn't have political experience, and a lot of folks were like, Bloomberg was a Democrat, you know, who then ran on the Republican line because it was easier for him to win that way. And a lot of people voted for him because they thought he would be very good at managing the city. That everything that's happening here is not working. He would be a very good manager. So when you compare that to the other candidates uh, itself, they feel like the rest of them are establishment candidates. Now, that said, uh, I think I think the Republican primary is going to be very long. I think they're going to go for a while because of how their, their schedule is set up. Uh, because no matter what happens in Iowa and New Hampshire, they have what's essentially being called an SEC primary, because the SEC, like college football, Southern primary, where I think Ted Cruz is going to do incredibly well down there because that, that Southern allegiance is going to kick in, uh, even if he hasn't won the earlier states. And if that happens, then it's going to become a free for all. Then they're all kind of back. Uh, for anyone that thinks that Trump is going to just disappear, it's not happening. It's not happening. Do, do I think he will win the nomination? I don't know. But uh, there was a very good assessment that happened on Meet the Press this past weekend and other entities. Trump has led the national Republican poll for more than two months. His margins are growing. His favorability, unfavorability favorability ratings are improving. And he's winning in battleground states. Unless just complete, utter catastrophe happens to his kind of campaign, you don't have that kind of trajectory and it just disappeared automatically. It just, just doesn't happen. Now, on the flip side, in 2008, we were still behind nationally in the polls of Secretary Clinton. Uh, and we were starting to gain in Iowa in many ways. Uh, we, we picked up steam probably the first week, I think December is when we finally took the lead in Iowa, but we kept building up to that. So there's a lot of time left for the Iowa caucus. Uh, but I think Carson, uh, in large part, is people see him as an outsider. Everything that you uh, have uh, ascertained so far is that he apparently is an incredible in these small town halls. That he's very disciplined with his message. He's very clear when he's articulating. Uh, and, and that's going to resonate. And when you think about, again, the Iowa caucus, uh, as uh, 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 one of our bosses reminded us in 2008, he said, President Obama had what is determined to be a modern day landslide. And we only received 53% of the vote. So if 47% of the country voted against you, then why would you think that in primaries you can't be successful if 70% vote against you? Right? Like these candidates, they're looking to get 20 to 25% in some of these states. Because there are so many candidates in the field. It's going to divide it up. Uh, and so they don't need huge numbers. Uh, my, my thing about Carson, I don't know what kind of infrastructure they're putting together to know can they carry it. I don't know if they can carry it. Which is why the Bushes, Kasichs, uh, Rubios of the world are always going to be competitive because they've been building infrastructure. Uh, your hand went up. Well, there are a few hands. So yours? No, no, no. You're good. Good hand. Um, yeah. Um, I, I just want to go back to your last comment uh, about the coronation. Hmm? No, 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 the flowers. You're talking about the coronation. Oh, no, oh, carnation. Carnation, right? Oh, there's a coronation. I was like, I'm not a king. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know flowers in, 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 I don't know the French, but in English. I got you. I got you. Um, but, so, who, who are we here in that story? I just was wondering. You as the individual have to determine that you will be the carnation and not the rose or the lily. Because the carnation made a determination that I am who I am. I don't need anyone else to validate me. And I have the ability to go and pursue things. The rose was bragging about itself and the lily wasn't common. I think I had a new question there. Uh, you, given everything you, 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 you have done and you were there for Obama and all that stuff, um, why would you want to be president again? Is that, uh, I would assume that the novelty is often that you, you have other things, you have accomplished that. Being president will almost be redundant. Why not something else? Well, I've never been president. He's been he's president. Yes. That's, so yeah, that's a big, pretty big difference, right? <laughs> well, no, but you, you are talking about your own dream. Yeah, that's my dream. Why, why not something else? Because what greater way to help the public 
public service than inspiring to the best. Let me, let me convey it in this way. Politics is maybe the only profession that if someone ever says they want to be at the top of the game, someone will ask them, why do you want to do that? No, actually. No, it, no, no, it's no, not it's it's not, it's no, no, sense. No, just stay there for a second. Tell me of another profession that if someone said, I want to aspire to be the best, that someone would say, why would you want to be the best? No, it's, it's not the best part. It's not the best part, by the way. It's not the best part. I'm actually, I, what I was saying is that you have already helped do the best in many ways. But there's a is there something else you can, no, like if I had, I have many siblings, and I tell them, we have a doctor, we have this, we have that, why don't you do that? I'm asking, basically I'm asking the, the story can be narrated differently in regard to something else, because we can't all be president. If, that, if you want to ask me, that's what I want to say. I can't be president, somebody else can be president, but can you imagine the best different thing than just being president, is what I'm saying. I guess. So here's why I'm disagreeing, because those are different things. Because you're asking me about why am I aspiring for this and why not aspire for something else. It's not about your personal choice. I'm actually I'm trying to give you the story. If if you are you are representing us of Albany, yeah, Queens in Albany, etc. I'm asking if if you were to tell this, or if maybe I should start to trim my question, if you were to say this somewhere else, are there many ways in which other people also can aspire to you? Let's say they can all be present. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. And what would that journey look like? Is, is what I'm trying to say. If you can just give me one example. So I guess that the best way is, well, again, I think we're just going to see things differently because I would encourage them all, if they're interested in running for office, to aspire to the highest they want to go after. Because if they don't make it, they're still going to be successful within that field. Right? So, I, I if, so if I aspire someone to say become a surgeon general, they don't become a surgeon general, they'll probably be a medical doctor. So there, there would be no reason for me to tell them not aspire to the highest they want to go after because they're either going to achieve it or they're probably still going to do well. I get the point. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I saw his hand and then her and then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. The politician in me wants to keep you happy because I saw his hands go up. My question is just about um, running a campaign and when you were part of the, I forget the exact name, but Program? Yeah, the program. Yes, we can. Was that was that significantly different than other programs that you may have heard of or seen? Other campaigns that have been run different ways, and why do you think it worked well? Uh, there was some variance. I think we were much more focused on uh, metrics-based organizing and new ways to expand. We understood that if we didn't expand the coalition, uh, we couldn't win. And I think most other strategies would be, let's just go after folks who always show up rather than trying to expand the circle. Uh, now, the nuance, though, is you need a candidate that excites those people. Because you can expand it and have a, a much wider nucleus of prospective voters, but if they're not excited, they're not going to show up. No. Uh, but we understood, uh, we took a tack of how do you understand all different components of the strategy? A lot of programs I've seen, they only train you on one thing. So be the best fundraiser, you know, be the best data organizer, be the best org field organizer, be the best communication. That was a one week game plan where it was to learn everything. So you can be an incredible manager, you can understand the different components of it all. Uh, now I think in terms of what makes it, what made it most impactful and most successful, uh, I, I think it made us think as organizers in everything we did, and this is what I mean. You will have people who will do politics and political outreach, for example, so you're trying to get endorsements from elected officials. Okay, that elected official says, yes, I'll endorse you. A lot of times, it will then just kind of sit there, it will just be a name on a piece of paper. The organizing thing part process is, okay, I've gotten you on board, how can you now reach out to your network to ask them to be about being volunteers? How can you reach out to your network to host a fundraiser for us so we can expand and raise more money? Will you send out an email to your network that it would, we can capture that data? So we, it was a, an effort of you're constantly in organizing. Everything was about building up with data as opposed to just being in your respective little silos. Because when you're in your silos, you're not thinking about how it builds up to everything. The, the strategy or the line that was always told to us is a campaign is about who has the biggest list at the end of the day. Everything was about data. Nothing else mattered. The data didn't matter. Didn't matter. If
if someone told you a report and it ended in a five and zero, you didn't believe it. Because I'm thinking like, okay, if it ends in five and zero, it's probably not a real number. Well, I'm taking the microphone. How could you guys have been so certain about 2012? And many of us were nervous. Because the, uh, uh, the, we, you start from a place where uh, you know if you just win three battleground states, you're going to win no matter what Romney's doing. National polls don't matter as it relates to, this is like an electoral college strategy. So, for example, we won the Iowa caucus in 2008, and President Obama was still behind Secretary Clinton in national polls, because national polls were accounting for all registered voters. They weren't accounting for likely voters. They were accounting for people in New York and California and Texas who had no impact on what was happening in Iowa. And so people were seeing you know, polls being close in national polls that were assessing everything as an aggregate. But that's not how the elections are run. The elections are run on our state-by-state -state strategies. And we constantly saw that our numbers were stronger than his in each state. And we were always confident that we were building a narrative that he could not counter. You know, putting Americans back to work is job number one. We want to continue to move this country forward. You cannot trust Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney is going to do things you can't trust. He's not one of you. You can't believe that. There are many different reasons why you can't believe that. And then 47% take comes out, game over. Because then we, we, we built it up. We were like, we told him, you can't trust this guy. We've been trying to tell you this for months. He just proved it again. Now it's a choice. And every time we looked at the states, we, we saw we were expanding early voting. So for example, in Ohio, Ohio has something called Golden Week where there's one week where you can register and vote at the same time. So we constantly were having college students get involved immediately. We had early voting for absentee voting. We were banking votes along the way where people are watching TV and they're not knowing any of this is happening. So when you look at polls, for example, if you really want to assess what's going on, well, for, there's a website called uh, uh, well, Real, Real Clear Politics where they have a collaboration of polls. I read that all the time. Look to see if it's asking about likely voters versus registered voters. If it's a poll of some of our registered voters, that, that doesn't, that's not going to do anything. You want to find likely voter polls. And then you want to see what's the trajectory of those likely voter polls. And we kept seeing each of the states, our likely voter polls were stronger than his. And we just knew we had a, we had a far superior ground game. The, the irony of it all is uh, uh, on election day, they actually thought they were going to win. They, like we, uh, we, we, we were aware from their team. They thought this race is over. We're like, oh, okay, <laughs> And again, you look at the numbers. We won every battleground state except North Carolina. North Carolina. No, we were ahead of North Carolina, of course, of Storm Sandy Avenue. We were ahead on the early vote, and just it slowly takes down. But you went so quickly through them, I didn't hear whether or not they were in regards to the police training at all. And I also wanted to police training, training. Uh, in that regards to criminal justice. And I was also wondering whether or not you, how you came upon that that's what type of legislation needed to be enacted and whether or not you're thinking about expanding it to the national level or it's just what New York needs and how you came upon that decision. I uh, co-chaired, I'll, I'll do the second one first. I co-chaired uh, our criminal justice task force, uh, and we had about 40 different pieces of criminal justice legislation that collectively was being looked at. And so we divided up who took what. Uh, so one of the bills, at least one of the bills, was specific on training that another member carried. Uh, and we essentially divided who was going to sponsor what bill, because you can't sponsor all of them. Uh, I made a determination about our bills uh, because one thing that I kept seeing is people were not aware of the health conditions of incarcerated individuals in a very, very transparent way. Uh, and when we think about, to me, the criminal justice element, 
You have to have elements before you even get to the system that need to be reformed. But when you are there, what are we also reforming there? So our message that we call them was before, during, and after. What are we doing before someone gets incarcerated? What's happening during their incarceration? What happens after they come home? So on the after they came back home, Fulton Future was one of the initiatives that we championed uh, where when folks were coming back home to the district, they can have services on the front end. Uh, on the before element, uh, we, we pushed heavily on, on training, on funding, on body cameras uh, itself. Uh, on the during, special prosecutor was one of the big ones itself. So uh, the governor signed an executive order that uh, the AG can now jump in and, and, and either determine to oversee or become the special prosecutor himself throughout the brag if an individual dies at the hands of an unarmed individual dies at the hands of an officer. So that's how we made that determination. Now in terms of uh, amplifying on a national level, uh, uh, next week I'm actually um, speaking uh, at Congressional Black Caucus um, three different times. And several of them are talking through what we've been building in New York and how we think we could be a model that the rest of the country can follow. So I have a, a real question and just a, a little question. Um, I'll start with a little question first, which is I've been looking for years for some support for that statement about the third grade reading scores and um, building years. I, I can find lots of politicians saying it, and usually politicians, um, up to and including Hillary Clinton. I can find nothing, <laughs> like if from anywhere else. Urban Justice Center. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I don't BS folks. I don't give up stuff so I can source. So Urban Justice Center helped identify that. But um, yeah, actually, no, we can talk about it <laughs> for the dinner. Because where they sourced it from was people saying it. Uh, if I can tell you, I don't, I don't contribute based upon uh, hearsay. OK. All right. Well, anyway, I would love, because again, years, I've hired people to help me find, like to try to find the rest of it. So that's not the real question. Assess what uh, some of the data points that were assessed in the campaign fiscal equity court case in New York, which led to the courts determining that the, the city and state were underfunding uh, those schools, particularly. One of them that they uh, sourced was that uh, attribution rate. Yeah. Uh, again, I would love to see, because like, I guess it's become, like, it's become a sort of part time thing for me because I, I'm just sort of like, I want to see. The, the actual data and not people sort of sourcing it to other people who have said it. But I will, I will continue to look. Um, but the question question is, is what, I just want to get your take on Black Lives Matter, the campaign, their efficacy, um, their tactics, and what, if any, um, significant kind of impact you would imagine um, if you had a crystal ball they're being able to have on 2016. Uh, I think that I think that the fact that we're still talking about Black Lives Matter demonstrates that they're having some level of success uh, because we, we've all seen how slogans have uh, trailed off quickly, um, regularly, and they have not. Um, the fact that uh, you have uh, individuals getting on stage and then leading to the hiring of staff and in the Sanders campaign. Uh, public and private meetings that Secretary Clinton is having to do uh, itself. It, it's incorporating in that manner. Now, where do I think it can be more effective? Uh, there are so many different areas one can try to focus in on criminal justice that I think there has to be a, here are the two, three, five, ten, whatever that number is, that we are going to focus on for this year. Uh, and that part I haven't seen clearly enough. Now in New York, there's the Justice League where they have a 10-point agenda. Uh, here's what we're going to work with for this year. Uh, I think if there's a way that, that those are part of Black Lives Matter and, and uh, relevant other entities could do the same thing, I think that would be the most effective. Because if you're just saying, well, cops who kill us need to go to jail, and that's it, there's so many things that are a part of that. you know. Uh, at least 2016, I think it, it, if done right, these candidates should have to describe what are they tangibly going to do on race relations to change things. You know, are, are you going to push for body cameras across the board? And how do you fund that? Uh, are you going to push to identify ways to have someone removed from the force if they kill an unarmed individual? 
are you going to look at, uh, to, to one of your questions, the other piece that I've spent a lot of time on is, is on grand jury transparency, uh, where if you identify that someone didn't have a case move forward for whatever reason, okay, then you can redact elements of the transcript, but you should be able to put out the legal instructions that were demonstrated, because what happens often is someone will give legal instructions to a grand jury knowing the charge is too high so that the charge can't be met uh, itself. Uh, and so for me, that would be the tangible, tangible things that would be helpful for next year. Uh, I, and I think, not to make this overly partisan, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what the Republicans are going to say. I, I just, like, because they're, they're, you're going to have to go down the road of saying something that's going to anger the cops and anger law enforcement. And I just, I don't see how they can do that in this environment. To your like Ben Carson question, things intertwine. I don't see how you can say, I'm pushing far right. I want to say something that's anti-law enforcement, because then they look weak on crime. You know? uh, so I think it then will push the Democratic candidates even more so to say, what are you going to do in a very tangible, real way uh, itself? You know? You know, Ferguson, uh, one thing that we did see that was transformative is they hired, uh, they elected um, African-American officials uh, now in a great number that they had before. Um, part because they were able to utilize the organizing into a more tangible and continual way. Um, I think that's a, a, a metric for success as well. Uh, I think the last thing for me, I can't remember where I was at, it was a few weeks ago, uh, and I said, if, if we're having conversations about Black Lives Matter, you're trying to convince someone that Black Lives Matter, that means to the person you're talking to, the life doesn't matter. You know? So just having a conversation with that person is not enough unless we're giving them very specific things that have to change. So if we're talking through, okay, if you kill someone, you go to jail. If you do this, here are the charges need to happen. Not just a community review board, but it has to be more substantive than that. You know, what's happening around grand jury reform? Uh, what's happening around the collective process? You know, to me, those are the tangible things. And something that we've seen so far, just going back to your question again, is the, the AG made a decision here to pursue some cases and other cases he decided not to pursue. And the ones where he chose not to pursue, we actually saw that the community was relatively actually okay because they felt like, okay, someone actually took the time to try to look through the facts to see does this make sense? Where they felt, as they do all the time, that no one's actually looking at the facts. They're like, oh, it's a cop, okay, well, nothing's gonna happen. So, I, I think there has been a level of effectiveness because it, it has clearly sustained the conversation. Uh, it has people talking and engaging in ways that they weren't before. Um, it's not really clear where is the actual organization per se, because there's a lot of entities a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. But you know, in, in the in, in the '60s, you know, there wasn't just one organized. You know, I mean, and, and I think sometimes. You know, when we think about you know, the, when, when King gave I Have a Dream, you know, there were other speakers that were trying to stop him from being the last speaker. You know, they, were trying to cut, they were trying to cut his words off. Uh, they didn't want him to speak at that point. It was Dorothy Irene Height you know, who said, like, why are we going to do this, sir? And so there were a lot of different entities who had their own factions, uh, but they understood a bigger agenda. You know? And you know, this comes back to the history that we, you know, we were talking about, about, how do you continue to educate people about history? They went to the march. It was a march for jobs and freedom. <laughs> right? There was a very clear, here, here are things we want to focus on. I don't feel that happening right now. Uh, but I think it can happen if folks came together to say, okay, here's what we're going to focus on right now. And last thing I should say is understanding there are some things that are just simply not going to happen uh, with Republican leadership uh, in some of these cities, states, and federal. It's not going to happen that you can focus on when you have democratic space. So for example, in New York, we had, we're pushing for discovery for justice, where a prosecutor can know all the information and evidence, but the defense doesn't. And you have a lot of folks that are taking plea bargains because they're afraid of going to trial. That's just a terrible scenario in every aspect. The Republican State Senate in New York, there is no way they're gonna move on that. Because for them, they look weak. 
so clearly I got a lot of thoughts on the, on the, on the movement itself. Uh, and, and I think, uh, not that I'm pushing for any particular candidate, you gotta assess all things. I think if Biden jumps in, it will further accelerate the Black Lives Matter conversation. Uh, because, and this goes back to the state's conversation, his ties in South Carolina are so strong and so real as they, hmm? Biden. 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 That, that, hmm? As in South Carolina. Yes. yes. That you're going to have, I think, two different things that will start to happen. I think he's just going to win South Carolina. I don't think it matters even happen in other states because just people vote for who they like and they, who they relate to, and there's a connection that happens there. But you're equally going to have a heightened black energy that I don't feel happening right now. You know, I think folks have kind of resigned themselves to it, either be Secretary Clinton or it be Senator Sanders. I'm not sure where I'm at, but folks, folks are not hyped like they were in 2012. And, and and you saw you saw yesterday when Biden was in Pittsburgh, people were losing their mind about this guy because there's there's a different vibe to it. And I think it actually will spark some real conversations. Why? Very specifically, because Biden and Secretary Clinton will have to talk about old crime bills and drug bills and how it has impact on particular communities. And then you're going to have people who are going to talk about their votes and their legacy on the issue and the histories on the issue and how that impacts all the Because their votes are substantially similar. Like their history in terms of what they've been supporting. By the so Biden, Biden and Clinton are right there and they can with everything, it's just Biden has uh, eight years of riding with Donald Barack, right? Yeah, I think and it's, it's game changing. But did you let him back in? Uh, he was one of the leads, yes. He was one of the, yeah, yeah that Clinton, it was Clinton's, it was Clinton's her husband, but he, yeah. he jumped in there first with the let's do it, so. Yeah. I think, I know, we, I know there was someone else, well, yeah, I didn't get a question, but I think, I think the, the piece is, I always think more people running is always better. The fact, even in this conversation, this is a perfect example. Most folks don't even talk about that. Martin O'Malley's in the race, you know? Lincoln Chafee's in the race. Like, people not even talk, Jim Webb's in the race. Like, there are, there are actually five Democrats running for president right now. People not even talking about them right now. Which, if, when that happens, you don't dive into the, the tougher issues. You know, you, you kind of you slow walk the talk on, on tougher issues. And, Race relations and criminal justice are number one in all polls in the black community nationally right now. Off the charts. Now, and it's related to that, I can tell you're a data person. So that comes from brilliant corners. Um, Cornell oh, no, Wilson. I know that's right. No, no, no. No, no, I know that's good. You know, you know that's good. You're good, you're good. You're good, you're good. You're good. Yeah. You had another question. I was just thinking about the experience to the different inter party politics and intra party politics. You are there laughing. From as an outsider, it seems that Barack had a tougher time getting the nomination from Hillary than he did in defeating McKay. But having said that, since you are an operating, how do you manage it to in the intra and the inter? Uh, it comes to a well, a few different things. One, uh, super delegates. Uh, make you have to handle the, uh, the internal politics of the private of the party regularly because you have delegates that are assigned to the DNC, Democratic National Committee, or Republican National Committee, that are not assigned to what the voting representation happens to that state. So, for example, I want to say in Michigan that Debbie Dingell, before she became the congresswoman, was a super delegate. So, independent of whatever was happening through the election, she was going to be a delegate and had in her own individual delegate vote at the nomination. So that forces you to have a lot of internal dynamics uh, itself. Now I think the nuance though is we knew, and this kind of goes back to your question about what we learned in the ESP training program. We knew that there were a lot of internal politics within the party where it would be hard to get a lot of folks who were tied to the establishment. And a lot of those, those types of super delegates were not going to be with us. So it forced us even more so to grow and expand the pie to the actual votes that we got. 
Because we knew in our mind, is, I mean, we, everyone has a running delegate counter here, assessing, okay, who's with who? All right, those are off the table, these are on the table, we have those. All right, so for us to get to the numbers that we need to, we need to expand in these targeted areas so that we can get more delegates over here. And so it, it actually, it forces you to organize even more. So for example, uh, best way to think about Iowa caucus map is if there are 100 people in the room, you need at least 15 to get a delegate. You have to have 15% to be viable. So if I know, uh, okay, I can probably get 30 to 35 people in this room, so that's going to give me two delegates. But I don't know if I can get to 45, because I just see the map, I see the assessment in the room. Part of my strategy leading up to caucus day is, all right, who's your second choice? Because you have second choices you're thinking about for the caucuses. All right, if you're not going to go with me, then go to undecided, so that you don't increase someone else's delegate numbers. Or go over to X candidate, who I already know, I've already done the math, that candidate can't get the, the delegate number. So I'm fine with them getting up to 14 because I know they can't get to 15. And so the in, inter and intra both are going through my mind at that time because I'm thinking through, all right, who are the super delegates here? What numbers are off the table already? All right, I know in order for me to get more delegates, I have to go get another 15 people in order to do that. So before even caucus day, I'm reaching out to high school students and calling them rock stars, which actually was one of our programs. Because if you're a high school senior, I know you're gonna be 18 on caucus day, those are books that I know I can go get that I know the other people are not thinking about. Why? Because you you worried about internal party dynamics. You worried about the folks that have been a part of the party 30, 40 years, who they're not even thinking about new folks. I'm going in to the church and saying, you can go work, work early in these two Sundays. So I can go bank these votes right now. I'm going in and finding senior citizens have you vote absentee and I'm sending you a letter ahead of time so again I can so I'm doing all these different things to handle the, the party dynamics. Now obviously in 2012 don't worry about that because you're, you're the nominee. Uh, I think it will be again Momola says incredibly fascinating in 2016 if you are a super delegate and you're having to decide do I support a sitting vice president or do I support Secretary Clinton? Because then you're making a real conscious decision. Because to me, there's such a uh, uh, it's incredible irony there, right? Because, again, I don't even know people's party affiliation, but this is for the purpose of this exercise, right? If you are a Democrat, logic would tell you that you probably voted for Barack Obama twice and you like his policy. So logically, would it make sense to then say you wouldn't align with the person who was his vice president? So then you have to determine what's your political strategy around that. You know, well, political strategy, I mean, let me go after it because we want to make history. Let's go after it because we have a different vision that we can articulate with Biden. I don't know how you articulate different visions. You're, you vote for the same administration, so that's going to be a challenge right there. But the inter and the intra dynamic are both happening there. Uh, and, you're, and you're doing that constantly. And going back to the question, um, somewhat interrelated, we knew in a way, for example, if we get to Super Tuesday, if we get to Super Tuesday and we're down on the 100 delegates, we are going to win this thing. Because we had already built an operation in all the other states. And a lot of folks, a different question, a lot of folks, they come with strategies where they're like, okay, let me just win these first two or three and we'll be done. Like we don't worry about the first two or three because we have a game plan, right? We, we, we can carry this thing to June. And we go, and then you all saw what happened. We won 12 in a row. We literally had infrastructure there, but we did that to counter the internal dynamics. Because we knew there were some super delegates that there was nothing we were going to say they weren't going to be with us. So that's how you assess that strategy on both sides. Okay. I just have one other question. Um, I have to ask this because you use dreams in your title. Uh, dreams are such a long way to see in African American discourse, as you know. But there are many people who feel that many of their dreams were not realized under Obama. How would you respond to that? I know because you've been a mentee and all of that, it's probably a controversial no, no, response. Not. 
But do you think he, I was in China and listened to a program in which the assessment was that he stayed so long to really advance his key policies. There were African leaders who were saying when he went to Africa, well, what did he show up with? Um, so there's a whole other discourse that said dreams have been deferred, that he waited too long, that many of the African American communities, plural, that supported him feel that they did not achieve many of the things that he had a dream about. So is this another case of dream that we always have to wait and defer our dreams as like the news and others would say? Not at all. I vehemently disagree with the premise of what people bring up. So my, my job, I, I was the director of African American Outreach, right? So I, I had to go around the country consistently talking about what we accomplished and understand that there's some things that we hadn't done yet, but then talk that through. So my first question always when someone would say that is, tell me what he didn't do when you're telling me he didn't achieve some dreams, right? Because we start from the first premise of President Obama, at the time Senator Obama, his two fundamental things he said from a policy standpoint on why to elect me in 2008, I will end the war and I will get you health care. Literally, those are the two things he said, if you elect me, I will do these two things. So then we start from the place of, okay, I did those two things. So now, start really telling me, what did he supposedly not do? Well, he didn't do something fast enough. Well, what were the things? So when we talk about uh, employment, we've had the longest streak, streak of, of employment progress in terms of job growth in the history of recorded data for any presidency. Like that is just factual, right? We, we, on a civil rights element, Pickford, which was a civil rights matter in terms of uh, black farmers not getting the, the settlements that they were trying to get for decades, he got done. HBCUs received more funding than they had in any other presidency. Now, there were some that were, uh, were uh, uh, short, uh, shrinking because of accreditation, but that's different from the funding pots that went to them, right? As it relates to the healthcare law, people talk about student loans itself. The second element that happened in healthcare law was something that was a lot of people didn't even realize happened. If you did any level of public service, after 10 years, the remainder of your loan was waived. Most folks had no idea that that happened. So I would always jokingly with someone to seriously say, Barack Obama was elected to be president, not to be the side. And, when you, and, and, and will I acknowledge that there are deep things that have been happening in black communities for centuries. No question about that. Do we want and need more? Absolutely. But I will never accept the notion that Barack Obama did nothing for our communities. Like that's a, that's a ridiculous notion. If you want to say we hope more happens, happy to have that conversation. We want to say that there should be more progress? Absolutely. But th there's not a, a, an effort to be able to communicate he did nothing for our communities. I no, no, I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm saying that's what people articulate, that like our dreams were deferred, nothing happened because of him. Like, okay, let, like, let's, let's, really, let's really walk this out. Like, is that, really, is that really true? Or are we talking about the, again, fair point, perception versus reality? Right? So if you're going around and you're still dealing with, you know, cops killing folks, obviously you're going to be frustrated by race relations and criminal justice. No question about that. I, uh, I I don't think I've, I've, I've seen other presidents uh, get up, you know, when he talks about creating the My Brother's Keeper Alliance, where $80 million of direct funding and resources are being pulled together to help nonprofits and organizations focused on boys and young men of color. That's not helping communities of color. Right? And so it's like, it's one of those things. The point is late. That's the but the, again, but the late even, because then that, that infers that there's a particular timetable and deadline it was supposed to be done by. But well, it was, why did he have wait? It also took nine years before the Civil Rights Act got signed, right? Like when we think, so like when we talk about, and this is where we have to assess this, right? Around, we talk about 55, you know, 55 to 64. So it took nine years to get a Civil Rights Act done, but Barack Obama was late in what he did in four years. Like it, it, it's, it's one of those things where, again, we have to ask ourselves, when did you expect for particular things to happen? Then you got to do the deeper assessment. 
you have a Congress where they don't want to do anything to help them whatsoever. I wish I could have you. Well, you know, I, 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 I had to. It was tough for me to run for office. No, no, no. No, I got you. I got you. I, 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 no, I, 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 in, in 20, a big reason why I left the White House in 2011 was the going around the states in 2012. And I literally was going around the states all the time. And, and this was a, I, I would say to them, uh, uh, there was two different message strategies that I would have when I go to these meetings. One was specifically about communities of color, and then one was the broader Obama versus Romney. And I'm like, okay, so let me get this straight. You telling me things are so terrible about Barack Obama. One got you health care. One is saying, I'm going to take it away. One is able to get people jobs and is to try to do more to get jobs. One is saying, I don't care about 47%. Like I, like, I need you to really help me to understand how this is better than, than this one right here. And if you, can, if you can actually tell me overall progress is not happening, Show that to me, to your point about the data. Show me that overall, you can always find anomalies in data, right? There's always going to be outliers. But overall, you can't make that argument. But I, I think you what? could make it about jobs, right? I mean, black unemployment is still 10%. Unemployment. Or black. Black unemployment, unemployment is 5%. But, but again, this is, this, this, is, this, is a, this is a message point where we get in, in, in message battles. Unemployment is a barometer of are you actively looking for employment in particular industries or particular time I'm just saying about there are, like, let's talk substantively, right? But like the, the unemployment number. The unemployment, so black unemployment is still almost double, which it was before. Which it was it's before. gone down, but it's still double. Right? But, I got you. I got you. But, 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 but those are the battles. And if you still, if you go down to certain communities, if you start to look at the communities that uh, my brother's keeper is aimed at, their unemployment is 15 rounds in the corner to 20 percent very often. I live in the South Bronx as well. That community like it's off the charts. Coming up with um, asking philanthropy to, to deal with things that haven't been dealt with at the policy level, it's I think a fair discussion to have. As opposed to saying there's no point of disagreement, like there's nothing to discuss, like there's no disappointment. Disappointment there, or for points to push on, it's a fair discussion. So here's how I count that. Not, when he's not running again, but like that's understand why like, can't have him when he's trying to get elected. But again, here's, here's, here's how I count that. If we want to say Bronx specific, Bronx uh, unemployment has gone from 14.1 down to, to 9.2, uh, and in large part, I mean, obviously because of the demographics there, is because of Black and Latino communities getting more jobs. The unemployment ratios have improved itself. I think to the core point of what people will say is nothing has happened here. That is an argument that I think is, is a almost nonsensical back and forth because if someone is starting from that place, there's nothing I can say factually to go back and forth with them. Right. But I, I do think that there's some points because it seems, I, and I, I, I voted for Barack twice, walked around the streets of Philadelphia, knocking on doors in North Philly, you know, to ask people to vote for them. I'm not like a hater. There are some points that could stand some actual sustained engagement that very often um, it feels like an either or. Either you, if to raise a critique is to say he's done, you know, which you're just hating on him and what was he supposed to do? Um, but you, I mean, you, there, there's no place to go there. So how do you build on it? If, if you want to say, I, I'm supportive, I get those people would like to be sooner shoot you than vote for anything you want to have happen. I'm not, I'm, I'm not insane about this Congress. Um, but some other things happen, like it, now the whole, uh, uh, all the governors and state houses and blah, 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 we've had some substantive change as a result that do impact black people at a more local kind of community. Anyway, so I, I think it's fair that we have been here to, to take a little bit seriously the spirit of Carol's question, is Carol asked the question, right? If not, you know, we're saying, okay, all the dreams are deferred, and you're like, that's not my experience talking to people, that's fair. But I'm sure you understand the spirit of the question, which is there's some things um, that are pressing. And, and can, how do we have a conversation about that that can be taken as something other than 
just you are clearly dismissing everything Obama is, has done, and uh, has had to overcome, which is a little bit, if your intention or not, is a little bit of, of how I took your response. Well, my response was based upon the question. The question was dreams deferred. Right. So that kind of language means someone is posing it in a manner of whatever has happened is either have, has either not happened or not happened fast enough. No, no, I was, just, I was saying there's simply another side to the theory of the dreams. So, uh, yeah. so that's a separate element. No, so, I'm so not, walk me through that. I'm not teaching Cornell West at all. No, 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 it's all right. I'm so, well, what's the other element saying, of the dreams? I'm just saying this, in, since you gave it a title, of course, I included the language of dreams. It's fair game to say, well, are there any complications in there that we can talk about it? Different from just simply saying, I think it's a grant. That's no, that's fair. So, but I was basing it because your first question about dreams defers, that infers a timetable. So, when you're saying about what's the other conversation around dreams that you're asking right now, I guess no, I'm asking that to you now. No, I'm just asking you, you put dreams in the title. I'm saying there are people who can equally say that my dreams are not fulfilled. That's what I'm asking. That's all that I'm asking. And there are many. Y yes. Yes. About that. Yes. But I haven't said yes. you have to, you won't really should be in my message. No, 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 but see, well, hold on, hold on, but, but, but see, but, the, but I always counter that because when people say things like that, that's because you're saying you're being on message. What you supposed to do? No, 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 because, because then that's, that's not genuine, but because when someone, because when, when people hear, communicate that, that's kind of essentially saying you're giving me politician speak. No. I'm not saying that's what you're intending, but I'm saying when people that's say you're, you're when you say you're on message, that, that's essentially saying you're giving me talking points. So, so when you're when you're talking through, that's what I'm saying. That's why I want to understand the clarity of the question. If someone is saying, "I have not realized my dreams," yes, point taken, no question about that. If someone is saying, "I haven't seen progress in dreams being realized because Barack Obama hasn't done it fast enough," which was the kind of the original kind of language we talk about dreams the first place the president. That's, that's a different kind of question itself. And one thing you do raise from is the constraints under which he operates in. Right. Uh, Republican mm -hmm. control Congress. I mean, he can't just push through stuff like that. Yeah, it'll make things life easier. <laughs> no, but for, for ourselves, just of course. Um, for, for ourselves, don't you have an idea that certain dreams necessarily have to be deferred at a particular moment? And think about what we defer and why we defer it? Can Absolutely. It is it? 100%. Which is actually a part of what I was trying to ask earlier because some things, not everybody, it's a question of destination. We can all get there at the same time and not immediately and, and not about time thing. I think actually it's a very healthy thing to say that these things were deferred no matter what the reason, Republicans, whatever, it wasn't, the economy was down, we wouldn't have, have the money, and etc. But it actually is a very healthy thing to do. To say think, that certain things were deferred and we just have to work in next time. We know what we have to carry on. Right. But there's a slight difference there, right? So there's a difference between I will uh, hold off on pursuing this dream right now for a few years because the time is not right versus I'm going to hold off on pursuing the dream, period. Yes. Right? And, and so if I'm, if I'm making a determination of I'm not going to run right now, I'm not going to do X right now for whatever the reasons may be, Absolutely, right? That, that makes complete sense. What I think often happens, and again, tied to, to, to one of the original points about going out on the road, is within our community especially, there were a lot of people that felt things did not change for me quickly, and I associated to Barack Obama was president, he should have been able to make this happen faster. It's how a lot of folks made that determination on the ground. We got a black president, I've had a bad circumstance, you, you should be able to turn this around quickly. And they, in turn, part of their dreams feel like, well, my dream's not being real, I feel like it's getting better for me. I have a black president, it's supposed to get better for me because it's a black president. And all I'm saying is that both of those happen concurrently. That you can have progress happening in your life and in your community and still need more to happen. The challenge that happens that I see though is well, nothing has happened at all. But what is the meaning of the time is not right? Because I can decide, well, again, let's use a political example. 
I can decide I'm not going to run for office now, but decide to run four years later. So I haven't stopped my dream. I just made a determination that right now is not a good time. Like, I, I get asked regularly, what am I running for next? And I, I'm literally telling folks, we, we can't even focus on that right now. Which is very different from, I'm not going to run for a higher office so that you can go run for higher office. I'm not gonna go run for higher office because I don't think I should be able to go that far. Because if I don't make it, and so many people don't make it, why would I pursue that? To me, those are very different tasks, very different approaches. So let me ask you another one. Yeah, we have to. I'm here till 1 a.m., so I'm all right, go on, come on.
policy is that. Uh, they are tax credits that are now being put in place to encourage companies to come back into parts of particular communities, which in large part, you, you have an economic issue because folks don't have access to continual jobs. And in large part, it's because we're not training them into the, the skills that they need for the jobs that are coming up. And you're not creating incentives for companies to want to hire those people. Because it's just a dollar and cents exercise for these companies, right? Uh, and so the very easy effort, uh, if you will, is creating more economic incentives for those companies to hire our folks and to train our folks. So something we have in the Bronx right now is called Bronx Hire, where companies have communicated to us um, through the state, uh, I would love to hire and train individuals if they had X level of certification. So now what we've done is the state will pay for that certification so that it takes that question off the table now. So that's something where it's like, okay, you're saying you want to hire these folks and this is the issue, let's take this off the table. We can now address this in that pipeline. So there are things that in large part uh, were not being enforced and equally were not creating the incentive to hire and train our folks who needed it in that manner. Uh, and then tied to that is also there are not enough anchor institutions in our communities um, that are long standing. So you had a lot of old manufacturing that left from a lot of these black communities and they, they, they didn't come back to have either advanced manufacturing or new technologies or new industries that can replace that. Uh, and they were going to other places in that manner. Uh, 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 Michigan is a good example. Something that they did, uh, which was a brilliant idea, is they had an airport uh, terminal that was being unutilized uh, that the state started giving tax credits for movie companies to come on in to the air and, and take and record their movies from there, uh, which led to substantial revenue coming in. And that was surrounding, not just Detroit, but that surrounding Wayne County, Oakland County area in that manner. Concurrently, uh, they had Google come to Ann Arbor because they made the very clear pitch that you have the University of Michigan here, you have 100,000 people that are showing up on a weekly uh, basis for these games of all different uh, uh, ethnicities. Uh, this is an easy way to tap into this pipeline. Concurrently, you have Dan Gilbert who owns Quicken Loans and owns the Cavs who went in to Detroit and has now been buying up land and been very cognizant of, I'm going to hire people from here, but I'm equally going to train them at the same time. Which, all of those were economic strategies that people were not putting in place in these other areas. So, those are policy things that can and can immediately happen uh, that, I think, again, two different things. One, we don't, we're not educating everyone of these opportunities that are there either from the perspective employer or the perspective employee, and then two, creating the policies that can actually take that to greater continuous scale. Thank you very much.